So £9 billion of money on one Olympic Games, two weeks of fun. Um, I will just start by making a link. I went and gave a talk in our local primary school and was talking about the sustainability of the Games, all of those objectives, and one little eight-year-old boy put his hand up and said, but sir, mister, if it's sustainable, why is it in a different country every time? I was like, yeah, yeah you know, just be quiet. Um, <laughs> and then carried on, gave my talk, all this kind of stuff, and another one goes, mister... If you're saying it's sustainable, why don't you just build one building, make it last longer, and have all the sports in the same building? So it's quite interesting, isn't it, when you um, open up from the normal ways of thought to a, a different way of practicing. And I think uh, that, that talk was absolutely fantastic. Um, back to East London. Um, so the, um, I'm talking about health and safety, um, which I've never done before, probably never do again. Um, I have to say, it was never really a major consideration of ours. Um, I think like many things, like sustainability, like DDA, all of that, it's just stuff that you bring into your architecture and somehow assimilate into this process that gets ever more complex and ever more challenging. Um, the Olympic Games was, um, to put it in the wider context, something that the government just couldn't get wrong. The eyes of the world are on it. There have been deaths in, I think, all the previous Olympics in terms of building them. Uh, Sochi was pretty bad in that regard. I think the World Cup in South Africa was as well. So I think um, the government set out to have uh, an exemplary um, bill of health, if you like, on, on health and safety. But it did on everything. So in terms of employment, in terms of direct labor, in terms of apprenticeships, in terms of sustainability, this was one project with enough time and enough money that it could all be done properly. And it could therefore be a sort of flagship for the whole industry. And I have to say, they did do it very well doesn't come cheap. I mean, the whole of the logistics, i.e. security, site boundaries, costs £300 million. Um, the velodrome costs just under 1% of the overall budget to give some idea of how much it costs to do, do all of these things. It was an enormously complex project to transform that site, uh, very, very contaminated ground. It was divided into a north and south um, site. There was only five major venues which were retained um, for use afterwards, which was a vaguely new idea. So there was some... In that big challenge, there were some very sensible ideas, despite my primary school intervention, that should be taken forward to future games. So we won the commission for the velodrome, and we basically went out on this ticket that it should all be about cycling. Everything about that venue should exude cycling, be it the efficiency of the bike, be it the dynamism, the excitement of the track, um, or the efficiency of marginal gains, all of those things. It should really exude cycling. So we started off with the movement of going around the track, and as one journalist pointed out, well, that's better than the Tour de France. You sit still, they come past, and then, then what? Here you sit still, and they keep coming past. Good idea. They go around the same way as running, for some reason. We took our 6,000 seats, and we put half of them around the track. Cycling is very exciting. If you've not been, I recommend you go. There's a series coming up in October. You're very, very close to the action. Uh, and then around those half of those seats, we decided to put a concourse because we felt the big thing about the Olympics was here's an opportunity to get people inspired. Most velodromes are tin sheds. How can we get people to look in, inspire kids in the East End to take up the sport? Um, so we put a concourse around it, which would connect it to the other Olympic venues and other cycling activities, and then took the other half of the seats and put them up in the air, knowing that not all competition would have 6,000 seats. Manchester only has 3,000, for instance. Um, and that was probably what won us the competition. This notion that we would split the building in half and have half the seats in the roof and half of them wrapped around the track. And we were very excited about this idea that the geometry of the track would infuse into the geometry of the seats, which would then inform the geometry of the whole building. So from the track, you get a building which was somehow related in form. And that was the competition we were allowed to put out to press, the image. And so the project's in two parts. Um, a lot of excavation, a lot of concrete, Standard kind of technology, a lot of difficult geometry, but nothing particularly unusual, a lot of coordination. So that all went in the ground. And then above it, a big steel bowl, and we worked with expedition engineers, and that bowl was sort of locked in shape three-dimensionally, which had uh, big advantages. So that floated above the ground. And we, we took a view early on, which took us about a year to prove to the client, because it was risky, that we shouldn't do it like a conventional sports project. Here's the aquatics with its sort of undulating form. So to build a normal sports project with a big solid roof, you build a massive scaffold, prop it up, weld, bolt, and do everything in the air. We had this idea instead, following the paradigm of the bicycle, that we should really make it as light as possible. Could we take everything out of the project that's not needed? So it's like a racing bike. You've only got the absolute minimum amount of material at the end. So even though the site was small, and some people were saying we should put cycling on the roof, the mountain biking, we decided that was not a good idea. Uh, 
we would go for absolute lightness. Um, and that would give us big savings in terms of carbon, in terms of money. And actually, as it worked out, it meant from a health and safety perspective, it was quite interesting as well. So when you're dealing with a big governmental client, the opposite of a Helen, you have to take everything back to them. If you stand up as an architect and talk about aesthetics in a room full of project managers, QSers, government officials, you don't get a lot of positive feedback. You need to talk numerically to them. So we managed to kind of convert our aesthetic conversations into numerical conversations, which is a very good tactic. Um, and, we, and we sort of proceeded on a number of schemes, and we're talking about getting the tonnage of steel down, which is good on money, good on carbon, and good on everything else. So we went, we went for taut, light architecture. And eventually we persuaded them, despite problems they were having on the main stadium, we could build a roof out of cables. And to do that, we needed to get some... Um, double curvature in it. So we, we have an eight meter drop in this direction and a four meter rise, which are the holding down cables in this direction. And we lock the two together. So it's like a twisted tennis racket in form. Um, and then we started to produce these images showing that we could bring light in and, and put all the lights and everything up there. So cable net structures have been done before, 40 years earlier. Munich Olympics had that amazing cable net structure. That had a sort of perspex series of layers on top wasn't in an insulated, integrated building. This was going to be a very low energy building to run. It needed to be almost passive house quality in terms of its insulation and, and uh, air infiltration, etc. Um, and what we boil that down to, I can't give you the full lecture, but in terms of, of how we did that, we um, devised a series of paired cables at a 36 millimeter diameter that were laid out on the ground. We devised this node that would allow the roof panels to be dropped onto it. So they would be made in a factory in Nottingham, very lightweight, plywood. They'd come and sit on here, and we designed it all to take up the movements of the, of the cable net deflecting under uniform and ununiform loads. So that was laid out on the ground uh, in English winter by German subcontractors. We did have issues because the frame around the top was made in Bolton to sort of plus or minus four inches, and this was made in Germany to plus or minus two millimeters. <laughs> so between, you know, we're somewhere between Africa and Germany, I guess, in terms of uh, precision. Um, anyway, so very interesting. So that was all laid down on the ground. Um, and what's interesting about this is you don't need the scaffold. You could just pull this system up with a series of hydraulic strand jacks that are connected. You put some lengtheners on the cable and you start to pull it up. Here they're fitting health and safety. Netting underneath, so if there's any accidents at height, this is your safety net. So that was fixed on on the ground. Um, here you see um, on the ring beam around the perimeter of the, um, the, the bolt and steel work, we put a walkway. And that was good, because they were the permanent panels that went on to the end of the project. The lugs made the connections. We didn't have any adjustments built into the system, which was a bit of tension between geometry and, and tolerances. So they were all being strand jacked up. You see the yellow jacks there. And this was starting to happen. I've got a movie with no sound that should be coming up now. OK, so this, this was the day that the cable net went up. The press were really excited about this. The contractor hated the press, so he told them all to come at 11, and started at 7, and by 11 it was up. <laughs> <laughs> so that slightly speeded up, but not massively. So it was just pulled up into place. All the nodes were fixed in their position. We knew theoretically all the X, Y, Z coordinates. The engineers did an amazing job. They had an Excel spreadsheet that told them all the possible movements and everything for each of those nodes. So that's, thank you. That went up fine. And you can, you can see there the, the net is pulled taut across that structure. Amazingly filigree thing. And then they were just starting to fix the, the safety nets on prior to the panels arriving, which were being made at the same time in Nottingham. So um, there you see access around the perimeter, this sort of thing with a 12 meter change of height, the net pulled across the middle. And here were the panels which arrived, they were numbered, they had a bit of temporary waterproofing on the top, they dropped in, someone bolted them off, and that was it. So you could stand on that roof with no safety harnesses or anything else. So a sort of very integrated way of thinking about not just the building, but the process and everything that went with it. And thank God it worked okay, a bit risky. Um, so here you see the panels coming in, they had self-finished ply on the inside, and like everything about this building, it was actually quite cheap and cheerful. Um, you just saw the materials for what they were, no particularly special finishes. The, uh, the money men were out to get us, so we couldn't have any curves. This was all faceted. The only two curved things were the ring beam and the track. They did not insist on a faceted track, fortunately. <laughs> so actually, when you then come to compare buildings of similar span, these are the velodromes from previous Olympics. 
We were at 30 kilograms a meter squared on our steel work to do that roof. Amazingly, Calatrava was at 250 kilograms because those tubes have got 50 millimeter solid sections. They're like, I think they got stopped because people thought they were Iraqi super cannons when they were going through customs. Anyway, um, we, took that, we took that lightness to the, to the sort of ultimate conclusion, really, in, in, in how we managed to uh, get that structure to work. Um, and that philosophy of prefabrication, of making these components, we extended that to the rest of the building. So what we have is the building breathes in a natural way, and we've got a bit of air conditioning. Cyclists like it hot. We needed to warm it up, and we, we squeeze that into the space under the seats above our floating ring of glass there. So we had a series of prefabricated elements that came onto the building. So here you see, again, timber panels, uh, very low tech, plywood, um, just coming up and being bolted over the, um, over the steel frame there. And then um, we designed these as panels which could be fixed. The contractor decided to um, fix all of these on individually. So they had a series of teams working in the freezing cold, fixing on those Western Red Cedar battens. These were the sort of gills that allowed the building to breathe. Um, from a design point of view, we sort of pared it all down. And I guess we did 65 versions of that facade just to get the slots right. I mean, it's like all of those things that are simple. They take quite a lot of effort behind the scenes to get to work. Uh, when you get to the top of the building, um, if you go into the velodrome, you'll see this mesh at the back. That allows the air through um, and the series of louvers. When a race event's on, they're closed to make it very hot. The cyclists like to go fast. The air's thinner, they go faster. And actually, going back to that very first point about Britain, we want an Olympic Games. We want lots of gold medals. Uh, so we made the acoustics great so the home crowd could cheer the home riders and we get an advantage. We also made it hot because it's then the fastest track and Britain gets lots of gold medals. So it's all competitive. Um, but if you take that philosophy of this whole roof being prefabricated, how on earth do you fix those lights on? Um, velodromes traditionally are outdoor. It's quite recent and northern to have an indoor velodrome. Clearly for the Olympics with the TV, you have to control when that event's on and you have to know it's going to happen. So you couldn't have an outdoor track. We spend a lot of time getting the roof lights right, so you can have 300 lux and train with no lights on, so good for energy. In the games, though, they want 2,000 lux. They've got 3D, HD, slow-mo TV. That's the money for the Olympics. all comes from television. You need brilliant television. So we needed a really complicated lighting system that could give us this 2,000 lux on the complicated track. And actually, with the contractor, we devised a means by which we set all the lights in position on, on this scaffold on the ground and hoisted it up into place so we didn't have to have people working at height. So that was obviously very good from a health and safety point of view, all fixed on that scaffold with an access deck and just moved up into place. Um, so just on the sort of health and safety note, um, there we had a fantastic guy working on this, Dean Goodliffe from ISG, and he, um, the, the Olympic sort of client pushed health and safety very strongly. And um, he was partial to a drink, partial to a night out, um, and in fact insisted on having a design office in Soho because all the designers were in the West End. Uh, and what he organized that carried on for the whole project was a, a competitive system where he drew up on the entry into the site hut a chart, put all the subcontractors on it, and put all of their health and safety records for everyone to see. So it was really a naming and shaming exercise, but the psychology of it was fantastic. So what he did was he booked an enormous venue, all the contractors, architects, the whole team went to this place and he paid for the first meal. After that, it was the person who had the lowest health and safety record every month that paid. And the bill was about five, five to 10 grand per month. So these guys were absolutely gutted when they um, came bottom of the list. And so the bosses were giving their, all their staff a lot of jip because they would have to pay out of their own pockets. And actually, I have to say, as a mechanism, it took you out of the institutional nine billion pound Olympics into the very specifics of one small subcontractor forking out five grand for everyone else to have drinks at his expense. And sure enough, you can imagine the drinks order when they knew they hadn't won, but the other guy was paying. So um, the psychology of that worked very well. So um, we've done the building. The track itself, I'll just touch on that. Um, it's an amazing piece of geometry, really. It's, it's made out of Siberian pine, 40 by 40 mil battens, nailed on by hand. So a team of guys put this in in just about six weeks. Very beautiful thing. So those are the trusses at two-foot centers. All going in. The track's actually flat. It's just tipped up. Uh, the corners are are not quite the same, so going into a banking, coming out of it, slightly different, all very subtle. No two tracks are the same. This is different from any other one in the world. Um, slightly rounder, slightly faster. So here are the batons going on. They're just nailed on. The guys stand on those little 
Battens, 42 degrees, banking, quite <laughs> impressive if you go there. Even more impressive if you try and cycle around. And that's the, the finished thing. So the racing all happens above that black line. There's a safety zone in the middle, uh, and then the banking at the top. So just to conclude a talk on health and safety in velodrome, uh, we had the games. No, uh, this was the test event. Um, ironically, for the games, because the Olympic guys are what they are, they came and blocked out all the roof lights to get very, very standard conditions for their cameras. This was the, this was the test event in February before, with the light coming in. Uh, very successful. All the riders really loved the acoustics, the feeling of it. And actually, they, when we first opened the building, they all came in, the GB riders, and they thought, oh, this is great. When we train in here, we can actually look out of the glass and get a view out. We don't get this sense of being totally trapped all the time. Um, and here you see this idea that we'd shrunk the building as small as possible. The roof is very close to you at the top, trying to take out every square meter of cladding we could do. And there, just in terms of concluding a talk on health and safety, we built a building with an exemplary health and safety record for one of the most dangerous sports there are. This was in 2015, a junior girls race. I don't know quite whose bike that is, but they seem to have left it. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and as ever, I think, you know, it's a massive amount of teamwork in any of these projects. Um, and I think just, you know, thinking about health and safety and those wider things, it's a sort of endemic culture, really, and it has to be spread right through the team. As an architect, you have only so much control over what happens. Um, but I think that culture needs to be spread through everybody and, and the whole culture of how you design and how you build. And so th this was a big team effort. Thank you very much. <laughs>